for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, welcome to this episode of International Gathering. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor at International Church here with uh, Dr. Garrett Halweg, a uh, psychiatrist here in Honolulu, and we have a special guest, Dr. John Sanford. Now, Dr. Sanford, you wrote a book called Genetic Entropy, which we've talked about before, which uh, proves evolution is false. But why do so many paleontologists and uh, paleoanthropologists, why do they point to the ape human transitional bones as evidence that, hey, evolution is real? Look, look, we have transitional fossils. They're there. After writing the book Genetic Entropy, which is, you know, really, um, it was kind of a revelation to re-examine things I thought I understood and then realized that I was, as I looked deeper, that I was wrong and that, in fact, the story was actually much more interesting than people realize. I was getting feedback, well, you must be wrong because we have these transitional bones. So the fossil record clearly shows ape-to-man evolution. So whatever your genetics arguments might be, they just can't stand against the evidence of the fossil record. And so that caused my colleague and I to critically examine these claims of intermediate fossil types. Chris Roop uh, is the person who uh, did most of the research for the book Contested Bones. And together we pulled together all the information and basically presented it in a coherent way. The production of uh, Contested Bones was a four to five years of intense work. We were really gratified when we were finally done with it. And we realized that people were reading it and finding it fascinating and that it was enlightening people who had been taken captive by the, the standard hype of we find bones that are intermediate between man and ape. So the reason we spent those five years is because we wanted to show that not only does genetics show that we didn't evolve from ape, but also the fossils themselves speak of um, that man is distinctly different from the apes. Tell us a little bit about that. What was the, the process for examining the, the evidence? Maybe what is evolutionary's main argument about these fossils? And how did you come at that? As Chris delved deeply into the contemporary literature, the first thing we discovered was that the stuff that's produced for the mass audiences, like the Nova Specials and that sort of thing, National Geographic, those things are, are basically building a case for the traditional evolutionary perspective. Since all those people tend to believe that evolution is true, they build everything else around that foundational assumption. And so as we started to look through the literature, we were not assuming that evolution is true, and we were simply wanted to hear exactly what the people in the field were saying. And the reason we called it the book Contested Bones is the first thing we realized was the people in the field sharply disagreed on almost everything. Whereas what's presented is, oh, well, here's we exactly know exactly how it happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and that's as, it's just as clear as day. Uh, you go behind the scenes at, and pull out, let's say, just quotes from people in their less guarded moments, and you realize that, that everything was is very contested, and in fact, the field is basically in disarray because every time they find a new skeleton, it turns the previous claims upside down. Mm. So, so there's not a lot of unanimous... Uh, no, it's not <laughs> unanimous. It's, it's just incredibly different points of view on every single one of the fossil types. And so it's just really intriguing that that's not more transparent, made more transparent to the public. Now, wait a minute. I've seen the March of Progress. I, I've seen that diagram that transitions from the ape to the human you're telling me that these drawings weren't based on scientific evidence that this is some artist's creativity or something yeah so the ape parade is actually now universally rejected this is one of the things that they can agree on is that the ape parade doesn't reflect reality and so that those beautiful, iconic images are so powerful visually, they almost prove it. You know, it's almost like you've, you've already, it's been proven before. Just when you look at that picture, you go, oh, well, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go from, a, from an ape-like creature to man. They just have to s straighten up and walk 
erect. And yeah. then they're. I like the ones where they end back hunched over again over a <laughs> computer or a cell phone. <laughs> like, and now we're going back down. Yeah. So about 10% of our book is in blue. And blue is the text where we're quoting paleoanthropologists and what they actually are saying. So you guys just went out into the field and said, okay, this isn't maybe our area of expertise. We're going to go find the experts and find what they're saying. And what you're finding is they're saying lots of different things. Right. If you just delve into the literature, not the, not the popular media stuff, but the actual scientific literature, what you see is uh, things are contested. And the, the things that are in the textbook are already obsolete. And there a lot of professors who are teaching paleoanthropology, and they, what they learned is, but when they were graduate students, is now totally obsolete. Could you give us an example uh, of maybe you know something that was prevailing wisdom that paleoanthropologists go, "Hey, we told you all wrong. So sorry." When I was just a boy, ages ago, the prevailing view was that there were ape-like creatures, and then there was a transitional form, and the the the, the transitional form was called. Homo habilis, able man, and then that gave rise to modern man. So Homo habilis was considered a very important transitional form. The interesting thing is, how many skeletons did they find? Well, they found none. All they found were bits and pieces of, of bones scattered widely over an area. There is no Homo habilis skeleton. In fact, there's just bits and pieces. At that time, that was the only transitional form they had, and so they they so, so they, they just found like it. bits and pieces of a skeleton and just presumed upon the rest. Yes, basically, you fill in the blanks with fill out, fill in the missing uh, bones with your. I think this bone went here. This one was probably a little bigger, smaller, uh, as needed to suit the theory. Right. So, so the people who were d- studying Homo habilis, that was the Leakey family, a very famous paleoanthropological family in the history of the field, they concluded that uh, they were seeing in the same strata, they were seeing human bones and ape bones and then these intermediate bones. The intermediate bones were so incomplete that you could have some human bones and some ape bones in the same skeleton. It was a mixture of, of bones and very incomplete. So the Leakeys, Mary Leakey in particular, after her husband had passed away, was saying, what we see here is transitional form, but then she she changed her mind and said, these are mixed bones. Over the decades, more and more paleoanthropologists have rejected Homo habilis. They're saying it's a what they call a wastebasket taxon, a taxonomic group where people would find bones that they couldn't classify as human or ape, and so they'd kind of throw them in the box and go kind of miscellaneous bones, and they called the miscellaneous bones Homo habilis. Okay. Okay, wait a minute. Darwin himself said the fossil record does not reflect a record of transitional fossils, but was confident it would be found, but admitted if transitional fossils were never found, the evidence would show his theory of evolution was false. Dr. Sanford, you're telling me there are no transitional fossils? Evolutionists need transitional fossils, otherwise they're dead in the water. So they're always finding transitional fossils, but they don't ever hold up to scrutiny. That's, that's the problem. Stephen Jay Gould was one of the most famous scientists uh, of my era, Harvard professor and you know, wrote many books and very popular author. He and one of his colleagues, Eldridge, wrote a paper which basically said, we can't find transitional forms. There's a complete absence of it. Uh, transitional forms. So we, so evolution must happen when we're not looking. <laughs> and so, so, so because there's not millions, millions of transitional creatures between all kinds of species, right? Not just mm-hmm. humans, but let's just focus on humans and apes. Because there aren't, and we should expect to find lots. Yes, yeah, so, they're so, doing it at night. Or <laughs> so, so, so basically, they introduced the concept of punctuated equilibrium, where everything stays the same, and then suddenly, when you're not looking. It changes to Boom. something new, and of course, that's not a transitional form. That's just a story. It's storytelling. They were the first ones to kind of blow a whistle on their own field, and they said, "Really, we don't have evidence, and so we need this kind of fancy-sounding term, punctuated equilibrium, to explain why we don't really find evidence for the intermediates." So all of these bones were found to support a theory. So people who were enthusiastic about evolution, 
their dream was to go off in some remote area and find ape man bones. And so guess what? People did find bones and they called it despite every bone they found an ape man bone. They were usually very incomplete skeletons. So one of the first of those was a man named Du Bois who went off to Southeast Asia because back then uh, Darwin had thought maybe the orangutan was the missing link or the, the, the origin of man. Because orangutans are in Southeast Asia, they went there to find it and they found some bones that were a little bit unusual and they called it Homo erectus. But the bones showed pathology. They were atypical, but they were also diseased. And that's, as we talk about this more, we're going to see that that's a regular theme, is that a lot of the bones that are considered transitional forms are actually humans that have undergone inbreeding, people who are genetically compromised. And so because they're anomalous, they, they look like they're not quite human, but it's pathology, not a transitional form. How do we know it's a pathology? I mean, how would we know? Like, hey, this, this skeleton, something was wrong with this guy. Is it the DNA that they're examining? What? What leads us to that conclusion? There there needs to be more DNA research done because those bones do have DNA in them. Surprisingly, it hasn't been done. Let me just give you an example. The hobbit. You maybe have heard of the hobbit. It's called uh, Australopithecus florensiensis. And so it's got a fancy name. It looks just like a small human being. But it has deformities, especially in the teeth, and other parts of the skull. And because they're tiny and they're, they're sickly, they're considered you know, more like an intermediate between a smaller, a smaller ape. But actually, the analysis is their actual skeleton structure is distinctly human. They can measure the, the bumps inside the brain case and know what, the brain, what type of brain Hobbit man had. And it had a very human-like brain. The Hobbit man is now widely considered a defective human being. But for, for at least a decade, it was being treated as a missing link, a missing species, a subhuman. But Hobbit man, which is an affectionate term for him, is he's just a tiny little human with deformities. And he, he's, he was on a small island called Island of Flores. And if you are, have a small population of people on a small island, they will inbreed, they will have show genetic degeneration, and they will grow smaller and more and more compromised. Okay, so there are other examples of that. Well, I, I, I just want to back up because I'm not a paleoanthropologist. So isn't this arbitrary? Like, um, you know, Native Americans, they lived alongside uh, European settlers with a very different footprint, but they lived contemporaneously. Is this basically what was done? Is this... They said, well, if, if they're buried in this, with these primitive tools, they were subhuman. Is that, am I getting this? It's a little more complex than that, but the, the best evidence is the actual anatomy of the bones. People try to make inferences from tools or other things, but like you say, uh, that, that's not the measure of man. Actually, tools are the measure of man. But let me try to clarify something. We mentioned that one of the first things we saw was that the Ape Man Parade is uh, rejected by everybody in the field, and now they call it a messy bush. They can't actually trace anything to anything. They're really uh, in a state of confusion about uh, how these different bones relate. But But the one thing they can say is that there's two basic groups. The first group is Homo, that is man, and then there are other bones that are called Australopithecus, Australopithecus is a long-sounding name but it, in Latin, but it means simply southern ape. So all the bones can be classified as either Australopithecus, southern ape, or human. That's really useful to explain to people who aren't familiar with the field is, okay, we have basically two types, and the question is, is there a bridge from the monkey-like creature to the man-like creature? And that's that's very helpful. Yeah, that's what's and, missing. And you're a geneticist, and so <clears throat> you know this is a forensic activity that they're looking at the morphology and trying to determine: is this an ape? Is this a man? Is this a transition? But you look at genetics. So in terms of chromosomes, how many chromosomes does an ape have? An ape has 48 chromosomes. We have 46. So essentially, genetically, if you look at the the DNA, let's say of Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, or, or these others, 
genetically, maybe a better measure is can they interbreed? Is that something? Is that an idea? Um, so interbreeding is a is a is a measure of. Uh, the same kind or the same species. We do know that, for example, Neanderthal interbred with Europeans, and now they found actually Neanderthal DNA in Africans too. So the Neanderthals were contemporary with human beings, and they intermated, and so now we have, some of our DNA comes from Neanderthal. Each, everybody in this room has Neanderthal genes. And so there's, there's no question that Neanderthal was one of the missing links. It was in the first Neanderthal skeleton was found during Darwin's era, and um, and so a lot of people wanted to classify Neanderthal as subhuman, or and so the early cartoon versions of Neanderthal was very ape-like, and as they found more skeletons, they found that Neanderthal was anatomically human. Uh, only the only difference was a slightly different shape to the skull. You know, we have an egg-shaped skull like this, and the Neanderthal has a, the, like an egg laying down. And so they, they're longer this way, and we have more of a high forehead. But the the brain volume is similar, and the, the Neanderthals were unequivocally very human. They made beautiful artwork. They made flutes. They made um, jewelry. They planted their dead with uh, what are called... Um, grave goods, meaning valuable things were planted, so they clearly believed in the afterlife. So Neanderthal is a good example. It was the first supposed subhuman. Uh, it's now fully human, and there's no just, question Just about like it. everybody else in his time just, and place. Yeah, right. So just different skull shape. Different, slightly different skull shape, but there are people alive today with the Neanderthal skull. So, so yeah, basically, don't point. Don't point at people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Neanderthal is Denisovans. Uh, uh, Homo erectus, Homo hobbit, ha- hobbit uh, Naledi, they are anatomically modern humans with 46 chromosomes. Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, you know, uh, Ardipithecus, uh, Ramidus. These are apes, 48 chromosomes, like so we can't, chimpanzee. We, we, we don't have the, the chromosome number for any of these fossils, okay. unfortunately. Okay. That would be a really... I'd love to see that sequencing be Me done. Me too. But I think that's what we would see. So Neanderthal was the first supposed ape man, and that's been totally overturned. The next one that was found was Homo erectus by this guy Du Bois, who went and found anomalous bones in Southeast Asia. And that was originally thought to be subhuman, but more and more now paleoanthropologists are classifying Homo erectus as modern man and not a different species, but with pathology. So there's two different things going on that give people the impression that they're missing links. The first one is there are a number of important finds where they have actually ape and human bones jumbled together. Yeah, a lot of these sites were where they would go out and get meat animals, bring them back to a central location, and butcher them using stone tools. And so the throughout these, these deposits, there's lots of bones of the things they were eating. People even now eat, people in Africa even now will eat uh, chimpanzees or gorillas or any other or, or any other um, thing they can get their, uh, their hands on for meat. But there were clearly apes that were being eaten, but their bones ended up intermingled. Mm-hmm. So that's the first big point people should understand is, hey, these, these are separate bones, these are apes, and these are human bones, but they're being found together, right. in, so they're being assumed to go together. So, so it's really clear, and there are eight major types of bones that are Wait. considered transitional. Eight? The Neanderthal is one type, oh, okay, erectus okay. is another type. I mean, how many bones are we talking? If we were to pile them all together, yeah, we, like, we, I mean, we are we talking like out. semi-trailers and ships worth of bones? So, so Neanderthals uh, buried their dead in caves, so we have a lot of skeletons of Neanderthal, okay. and they're totally human. Uh, Erectus usually is not found in caves. Sometimes it is, but they're usually not as well preserved, and they're not as uh, frequent. They all consistently show pathology, consistent with a small tribe that's inbred. And there's a paper that just came out recently in the field, and it basically says wherever they find bones that are that are considered old, they also see pathology in the bones, tons of pathology, pathology that can't be due to chance. 
In other words, people who are looking for intermediate forms pick up weird bones or don't look straightforward. So there was a lot of pathology early on, and those tribes not only were deformed and often very small, but they all went extinct. And so it's like a genetic entropy accelerated. If you have small populations that are in isolation, they will undergo rapid genetic entrop- entropic decay. But Dr. Sanford, we just learned in genetic entropy in discussing this that there, there should be billions of these. We should see them everywhere. We don't see them everywhere. They're extremely rare. Neanderthal is the exception, but Neanderthal is clearly human. Okay, so, so Neanderthal is off the table. We, we, we can discount that as a missing link. There's only one nearly complete erectus skeleton. Homo habilis, there's no skeleton. It's just bits and pieces. Sedaba, there's fragments. Erectus is now largely, many, many paleoanthropologists would say erectus is human. They're isolated tribes that degenerate. So then, if we were to summarize yeah. uh, maybe the main points uh, of your book, Contested Bones, that, hey, these are the main couple takeaways for people when somebody brings up transitional fossils or, or that's something they're wondering about. Uh, what would you give as a brief summary? What are the main things people should know? The bones are contested. The classic idea that we can actually trace the bones through a linear you know, ape parade has been rejected. The messy bush is basically acknowledged. They use the term now widely. Everybody agrees it's a messy bush, meaning they can't figure out who led what creatures led to what creatures. So they don't have any way to connect the dots. There are two types, ape and human, and there's no intermediates. The, the claims of intermediates are due to either humans that have degenerated, genetic entropy, or mixtures of bones between ape and man found in the same strata. That's the bottom line. Uh, the last part, I think we're running out of time, and this, is, this has been a difficult discussion because it's wonderfully complex. But, uh, but the bottom line is uh, the evolutionary perspective doesn't hold up. And uh, it looks very clearly that apes and humans are separate groups. There's no evidence of clear transitional forms. And lastly, um, the humans, uh, although they were often experienced uh, degradation uh, due to in isolated tribes, they're still clearly human. So they're, they and they say would have been able to intermate with every any other human, and. Um, the, from a Christian point of view, from a biblical point of view, what people would ask, when did these un- unusual human bones arise? And the answer is that they must have come, if you have a biblical perspective, post-flood. And so they're quite young. They're young, uh, younger than Noah, younger than um, Abraham. So within the last wow. few thousand years. Yeah. Sure, yeah. And so basically... Most of these bones, we think, were deposited in the post-flood glacial period, the Ice Age. So all, the, all these bones are human. And, and so a similar idea would be dogs. Dogs could interbreed. And, and if we unearthed the skull of, let's say, a pit bull versus a chihuahua, those would look very different. But in fact, they can interbreed, is that? So, so they're not all the same because we have the Australopith which is a which is an ape type, but when we talk about Homo, because so the paleoanthropologists talk about two groups, Australopithecus and Homo. All the Homo would be inner inner uh, could interbreed. They were all fully human. Some of them had pathologies, and so those pathologies make them look less than human. They are smaller and they have a, a less brain volume and they have all kinds of this like de- defects, and so um, so the Homo is is um, would be people descendants of Adam and Eve. All those different species, Homo naledi, which is the most recent one, Homo sediba, Homo uh, habilis, Homo erectus. All those um, are descendants of Adam and Eve. That's the bottom line. And some of them are pretty strange looking because of genetic entropy. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. So when the Bible says that God made them all according to their kinds, that's what it means. They're, they're not transitioning from one to the other. The apes are apes. Humans are humans, a special creation right. made by God. 
and the fossil record overall bears that out. Thanks for putting it in those simple terms. That that's that's good. Um, we had a lot of bunny trails this discussion, but that's the bottom line. Bottom line. Well, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Sanford. If you're listening, I encourage you to check out the book Contested Bones. If you're all interested in this, you will not regret it. Thanks so much for your time today.